Yes, I got Jesus. How could I want more? Oh, Jesus is, uh, he's, he fills our life. He's everything to us. He's, he's our Lord and our Savior and our Master, and he is always at work. God is always at work around us, right? Yeah, how many of you have been through the seven principles of experiencing God? I mean, you've, you've, you've studied those. You've looked at them, yeah. God is always at work around us is the first principle. And that is true no matter what. We may not see it, we may not sense it, we may not know it, but God is always at work around us. And he pursues a continuing love relationship with us that is real and personal. God invites us to join him in what he's doing. It's not the other way around. We don't invite him to come in what we're doing. He invites us to join him in what he's already doing. He speaks to us by his Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways, and so on. But that's not what we're looking at today. But that's a good word, by the way. Um, that's how we experience God in our life. It's very real and very personal, and it's a wonderful thing. We've chosen, I say we, uh, you didn't choose, I chose. <laughs> I chose, <laughs> I should have said I chose. Um, and, and I believe led by the Holy Spirit now. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that I just kind of plot out and calendar out things. But this, this month of November, I believe the Lord wants to speak to us about love and relationships and uh, marriage, families, uh, all kinds of things. I know last week I, I started with, uh, with the laws. There, there are four laws that God gave us concerning marriage. They were spoken immediately after God gave, created Eve, brought Eve to Adam, gave her to Adam, and then Adam spoke two verses in Genesis chapter two. Immediately after receiving Eve, Adam speaks two verses that contain four laws of marriage and relationships. Now I want you to know and remember that these are laws. These are not suggestions. If you obey these laws, you have a 100% chance of having a happy, great marriage. If you do not obey these laws, you're gonna be miserable. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have enough tenacity and stubbornness to stick it out. <laughs> and you might indeed stick it out, but that's what it'll be, sticking it out. And the joy and the happiness and the togetherness and the fulfillment and the excitement and everything that relationship is supposed to be will be, will be, will be uh, cast away. It, it, it'll, be, it'll be non-existent because it is actually these four laws that create love. They not only are the laws of love, they actually create love in our life. And so they're very vital and we're, and we're spending the month of November looking at these four laws. Now, just to uh, be transparent about, uh, about the laws, once you ever learn these laws, and they are so simple, once you ever learn these laws, you will always be able to see them. As a matter of fact, even complete strangers <laughs> that you don't even know You'll be able to be around a couple or around people in love and you'll be able to see whether these laws are there, at least, at least a couple of them right off the top of the bat, right off the top. And most relationships are not destroyed from big issues. Most relationships are destroyed from these tiny little issues that are out of priority in life. And so these are simple things to learn that have everything to do with joy, happiness, completion, and the godly structure of a marriage. I'll just remind you, it is God who created marriage. Marriage was not created by the state of Mississippi or any other state. Marriage was not created by some legislature somewhere or, or a, a lonely Neanderthal. <laughs> you know, no, marriage just didn't pop up into existence because somebody thought it was a good idea. Marriage is given by Almighty God. 
And God is the one that established it. And no matter what kind of rules we make about it or how it's governed in this crazy, ungodly, wicked world that we live in, marriage still belongs to God. And God instituted it and it works the way God designed it to work or it doesn't work at all. And so here are the verses uh, that, that, God, that Adam spoke. You remember this from last week. Um, Therefore a man shall, and here's the first law, the law of priority. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they two shall become one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Those are the four laws of love. The first one we looked at last week is underlined first up there and is that a man would leave his father and mother. This is the law of priority. This just simply says marriage is first. It's the first priority of your life. Nothing comes ahead of marriage except your relationship with, with Jesus Christ personally. But nothing can, can exceed it. We know that, that, we know that this was not spoken to Adam and Eve, even though Adam is the one talking it. God is the one that inspired it, but it wasn't for them. How do we know this? Well, because neither Adam nor Eve had a father. Or, and you know, you can say, you could argue and say, well, God is their father, and you're right about that technically, but biologically speaking, it's not the same as fathers as us. And they certainly didn't have a mother, so we'll be able to recognize Adam and Eve. You'll remember the great insight from last week that all of you took home and remember exclusively, and that is that Adam and Eve will be easy to recognize in heaven because they will be the only ones there with no belly button, right? They were not birthed. They had no umbilical cords. They are the only ones without a belly button. And so God spoke this to them for a reason. The reason is not them. The reason is for those generations that would follow after them. So for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother. That means the reason he chose mother and father is because that is the most dynamic blood bond that we have in our lives. Before we marry someone, our mother and father are everything to us. We obey our mother and father. One of the commandments is obey your mother and your father. And it is the strongest deepest relationship that we have. And so God is telling us, look, I'm going to show you how, how powerfully I mean this. Take the strongest blood relationship that you, have, that you have in your life that has ruled your life from the time you're born until right now, and I'm telling you that you are going to have to leave. And leave means let go of. It, you're going to have to let go of that relationship that you have with your mother and father. The greatest of all relationships indicating the fact that everything in your life has to be reprioritized. It means that marriage is number one. It's the top of the priority list. It comes before work. It comes before school. It comes before children. It comes before church. And remember, I didn't say Christ. I said church, all right? It comes before friends and sports and hobbies. In other words, you must, you must sub subject your relationship to the priority of your mate or else marriage is not going to work. The most electrifying part of priority is the fact that you choose someone. I mean, when, when, you, when you get down on your knees and you got the ring and you say, will you marry me? What you're saying is, I, I choose you. I, I choose you to be the focus of the rest of my life. I, I choose you to put at the top of my life, the top priority, and to give my life for you. I choose, you are the most valuable, the most important, the most significant thing in my life. Apart from my relationship with Christ, you are the highest relationship that I have, and I'm going to protect you and love you with all my might. That's what you're saying when you, when you propose. I choose you. Everybody wants to be chosen. And I'm telling you, that if you don't put them as priority number one, they're going to know it immediately and, and they're not going to be happy about it. And it's going to cause all kind of little bubbles 
little, little dingles, little things like that. Many times with, with women, it's the children or the grandchildren or something as seemingly innocent as that. With men, it's their job or their friends or some event they have. It's not the big things, guys. It's not the big things. It's the tiny things. It's the death by a million cuts kind of thing that, that chips away and eats away at marriage. And God says, number one, that means number one. Not number two or five down the list, but number one. And what, the way you can tell what is the top priority in your life is the one that gets the most service and the most attention. So what is it that gets the most service and the most attention in your life? That's your priority. If it's not your marriage, let me just encourage you to change because <laughs> it ain't gonna work. All right, here's the second law of love. It's in, the same, it's in the same verse, verse 24, and it's underlined also. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and here's the second law of love, and cleave to his wife. Now that cleave is, an, is a King James version of the word. Some of you have other versions that you read and it might say, um, you know, hold on to each other or join each other or draw near to each other, all kinds of terms like that. But cleave we don't use very often. It's the Greek word devak, which just simply means to pursue with all your energy. So what God is saying to us here in this, in this second law is, not only is our mate to be first priority, but we must continue to pursue them with all of our energy. It takes energy to serve each other. It takes energy to be committed to each other. If you pursue something with all of your might, it's devout. Uh, we're told in the Bible that we are to pursue God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, and all of our mind. That's devout. If I said to you, uh, I want you to go climb that mountain, that would be devout. Or I want you to run in this race, this marathon, that, you know, that would be devout. It means to pursue something with all of your energy now. So marriage works, but, but, but it only works when you work it, when you, when, you, when you work on it. It's not just gonna automatically fall into line because from the very beginning here, God shows us that in order for our marriage to work, it was going to take a lot of work. Marriage takes a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Do not fall into the romantic misconception that if I find my soulmate, if I can just find my soulmate, and look, if you found your soulmate, I'm not making fun of you. I don't want you to think that your pastor's up here ridiculing you. Because we've all been, we've all read books and we've all watched Harlequin Romances and what is that now this time of year that we all, Hallmark Channel, I mean, we, we've, all, we've all watched that and all those Christmas movies, they've been on for now, what, a month and a half now? I've watched it. I've watched 15 of them, I know. I'm, I'm telling you, Tanya loves those things. And they all have the same plot, you know. That's, that's the thing about it. They're comfortable because you know what's going to happen, you know. It's just different people in different situations, but the same thing's going to happen to all of them, you know. They're going to meet. They're going to fall in love. They're going to stay away from each other because they, they don't somehow can't get together. Then something terrible is going to happen and it's going to look like it's going to destroy them. But they fight through it, come back, uh, announce their love, get married, live happily ever after. That's the storyline. Of course, you all knew that. Well, I'm just telling you that that, that that is a romantic misconception. And that there is no such thing as a soulmate. Right. If you find somebody that is a normal human being, I'm going to tell you what, one truth about them. They're not going to be like you. And, and, and there's no such thing as a, as a soulmate in other words, it's not chemistry that makes a relationship work. You're not going to find someone that you just supernaturally have every 
part of life the same. You're going to wake up every day, say hallelujah, and everything's going to be fine that day and every day after that without any, any interruptions because it's not chemistry that determines a great marriage. It never is chemistry that determines a great marriage. It's energy. It's energy that, that works in marriage and, and not chemistry. You fall in love with each other. Listen, you fall in love with, you, with each other because you work on the relationship. You fall out of love with each other because you begin to take each other for granted, neglect each other, and stop doing the things that you were doing when you fell in love with each other. Marriage works according to every principle that God lays out because we serve each other. When I use the word pursue, the word cleave, devoc, pursue with all your energy, it, it, it's talking about serving your mate. That's the bottom line, that if we serve each other, we stay with each other, and if we stop serving each other, then our marriages and relationships began to crumble because God created marriage to bless us and to fulfill our life. And if, and, and, and if, and if we don't serve each other, then it's not gonna work. And I'm gonna give you two reasons for it. These are, this is in your notes, you got a blank to fill in. All right, two reasons why we must serve each other. Number one, we cannot meet our own needs. I can't meet my own needs. If I could meet my own needs, I wouldn't need to get married. But the fact is, I have needs that I can't meet. Matter of fact, I have a lot of needs that I can't meet. I have, I have psychological needs that I can't meet. I have social needs that I can't meet. Certainly, I have physical needs that I can't meet. And I have emotional needs that I can't meet. And so, when pa and I'll just use that, when Pastor Tanny and I were young and we were 16 and 17, 18 years old, we were both searching for the same thing. We were searching for someone who could meet the needs of our life because we could not meet our own needs. And when we found each other, and found through a little bit of dating and, and being around each other that we could meet each other's needs, then we fell in love with each other. That's what causes us to fall in love with each other. We are searching for someone to meet our needs. When we find someone to meet our needs, then we fall in love with that person, and Tanya then becomes the only person in this world that can meet my needs. Here's the second reason we must serve each other because we are sworn to fidelity. Now, fidelity just means exclusivity. It means no, no, can't shop at any other stores, okay? We're married to each other. We make a covenant. The covenant says we're gonna be true to each other and we're not gonna let anybody else come into this relationship and we're not gonna pursue anybody else and we're not gonna uh, be involved with anybody else's so we are sworn to fidelity, which means, and I don't mean this to sound a little bit crude, I'm not gonna say it ugly, but it, you know, don't take it that way, which means if Tanya does not keep her shelves stocked, I'm out of luck. I can't shop at some other store because I have said, I, you're exclusive to me. Yeah, yeah. So I am at the mercy of my mate mm -hmm. and she is at my mercy to fill her needs mm -hmm. because now we not only have covented together to be exclusive, but we have, we have already identified the fact that we can't meet our own needs. Mm -hmm. So marriage doesn't work if we don't serve each other. All right, now let me give you four problems we have in serving each other. Number one, selfishness. 
Selfishness is the number one problem in marriage. Marriage is brutal to selfish people, by the way. If you're selfish, you're gonna have a horrible time being married because every husband has what his wife needs. That's, that, that's, that's what brought you together. That's what drew you together. That's why you fell in love with each other and every wife has what her husband needs and the proof is that you fell in love with each other. And here's how it started. This is how, this is how it happened when it happened. Before you got married, all right, we're gonna take the analogy. Let's go back to the analogy of the store. We can't shop at another store. Let's take the store as an analogy. All right, before you got married, married, you cleaned the windows. You made everything attractive. You placed attractive products neatly arranged into the window for passersby to observe. You put a big sign on the door that said, open for business. And all the shelves in the store were lined with attractive products, wonderful goodies in there. And you had a big smile and a great attitude and you were ready for customers. Along comes a potential mate, a customer. Well, the customer walks through the door and he looks around and he says, wow, you have a great store. And you have a big smile on your face and you say, well, thank you very much. I am so glad that you noticed that. And I just really appreciate you telling me that. You are so friendly. You are, have such a great attitude. And then the customer asks, well, do, do you have this product? Well, I sure do. I have, uh, let me run, and you run over to the well-stocked shelves, attractive shelves, and you get the product off the shelf, and you run back, and you smile, and you say, here you go, this is it. And they say, well, that was so good. Do you happen to have this? And then, I sure do. And then you say, let me go get it for you, and you run to the shelf, you get, the, you get it, you bring it back, you present it with a smile, you have such a great attitude. And then they ask, uh, well, what about this special product? And uh, you say, well, I, I sure have that. Uh, sure do. Uh, but, but that's in the marriage section over there. And uh, yeah, that guy, oh, that guy, that guy with the shotgun, that, that's my dad. He, he's guarding that section. <laughs> and you continue shopping at each other's store. And you just enjoy all of the products and you enjoy all of the, all of the attentiveness and all of the happiness and the niceness, and you fall in love with each other. Why? Because you served each other. Because you had such a great attitude. Oh, you were so happy. You were so eager to serve. You put forth the best products at the best prices at the, with the happiest smile and you were just wonderful and great and you loved uh, your customer until they became a loyal customer. And when they became a loyal customer, you got lazy. You started taking them for granted and the very thing that made you fall in love with each other now makes you fall out of love with each other. You're no longer attentive. You no longer have a good attitude about things. You don't take care of the products anymore. The shelves are dusty and half stocked and yeah. And, 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 and you look around wondering, what happened? Well, you broke the second law of love. That's what happened. That law that says that you're gonna pursue me with all of your energy that you're gonna have a great attitude, that you're gonna be excited about this, that this is gonna be one of the greatest things in your life and that you're excited and happy about it and you don't neglect me and you don't forget about me, you don't take me for granted. You pursue me with all of your energy. You not only put me first, but then you make sure I'm first by pursuing me with all of your energy. Let me give you another little story, all right? Look, here's a parable, this is a parable. Now, this is a parable, this is not biblically correct, so don't go to Jesus and say, pastor told me that this is what happens in heaven, all right? 
I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm using heaven and hell as an example, but this is not going to happen in heaven and hell. But it makes a good point, I think. All right, here it is. In life, you have two choices in marriage. You have a heaven marriage and you have a hell marriage. Choice is yours. In heaven, there's this beautiful banquet table set up. Gigantic thing, gorgeous, full of all of the delicacies of heaven. You're seated across from your spouse, right across. And everything on that table is marvelous, beautiful, and wonderful like heaven can present. Taped to your hands are long utensils. And these long utensils uh, are too long for you to be able to get the food off the table and, and bring the food to your, to your own mouth. No, it's just, you can't do it. It can't happen. And, but remember now, you are seated across from your spouse. And so in a heaven marriage, what happens is the couples begin to ask each other, what is it that you want? What do you like? You, oh, that corn looks good. You want some of that corn? And they dip their utensil in and they put it in your mouth and then they look back at you and say, how about some of that chicken? All right, you put that in there, put that in their mouth. Oh, that mashed potato. Oh, banana pudding, man. We got to have some banana pudding. We're going to put some banana pudding up in there. And, and each of the couples enjoy all of the delicacies of heaven that they desire because they serve each other and meet each other's need. See, you have what your mate needs and they have what you need, but you are never going to be um, happy or satisfied unless you serve each other. Now, on the other hand, you can choose the hell marriage. What is the hell marriage like? Well, the hell marriage is the same setup as it was in heaven, where you have the same scenario where you have the beautiful table and all of the delicacies are in this huge banquet table, and you have the utensils strapped, and you're sitting across from your spouse, and you're both starving to death because you are too selfish to serve each other. That's why you're in hell, by the way. So you can have a, a heaven marriage or you can have a hell marriage. It, it, it's, it's your choice. And if you serve your spouse, obviously, you're gonna have a heaven marriage. If you fail to serve your spouse, it's gonna go in the opposite direction because remember what I said to you. Because I can't meet my own needs and because I am sworn to fidelity, I am at your mercy. I am at the mercy of your work ethic. I'm at the mercy of your uh, giving. I'm at the mercy of your willingness to love me enough to serve me and take care of me. And we are at each other's mercy because we can't meet our own needs. Now, if you're a person who likes to dominate people, marriage is going to be a very tough thing for you. Selfishness is number one. Here's, here's number two. Here's the second reason we have problems serving each other. Uh, pride and domination. You knew that was there, right? <laughs> pride and domination. We all have the propensity to try to dominate each other. I mean, it's kind of a human nature, right? It goes right along with selfishness. I want to be at the top of the heap, right? I want to be on balls. I want to be the balls. I want to be on top. Well, listen, you're never going to have intimacy with each other as long as one person's trying to dominate the other. Let me, let me tell it to you like Jesus said. Now, this is just one of those unusual experiences in the Bible in Luke 22. And I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how this happened, but... Jesus is at the Last Supper. He's telling them, they're all at the table. He's telling them somebody's gonna betray him. Um, they ask, who is it? Is it I, is it I, is it I? And then he says, all right, the one I dip this sop and give it to him, he's gonna be the one. And then he dips it and gives it to Judas and 
and nobody even notices. It's like nobody said anything. They're just still sitting there going, it's not me, is it? You know, you know. All right, that scene ends, and then this is what happens next. Watch this. Luke 22, verse 24. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And they said to them, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves you. This is Jesus talking to him. Jesus said, obviously, the dominant person is the person who sits at the table, not the one who serves. But I am the one who is serving you. So the disciples were talking about who was going to be the greatest because whoever is going to be the greatest is the person who's going to be dominant. And most people associate dominance with being successful in life. If I can just get people to serve me and I don't have to serve anybody else, then I am, I, I'm the boss man. And that's the way it works in the world. In the world, it, when you ascend the heap, it brings you privileges. In the kingdom of God, when you ascend the heap, it creates responsibility. And it, see, in the kingdom of God, becoming the top of the heap is totally different from the world. In the world, everybody wants to dominate because that means they're at the top of the pile. But Jesus said, I'm at the top of the pile. And let me tell you, the top of the pile in the kingdom of God means that you become the servant of, 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 of everyone. So what does this mean? It means that if I am trying to dominate my spouse, I am not Christ-like. And it means that if I'm trying to, to, to get someone to serve me without being willing to serve them, then I am not, not Christ-like. Let me ask you this question, and, and, and I, I don't want you to answer this question if you happen to be sitting here with your parents, all right? So if your parents are in here and they can see what you do, don't answer this question. All right, here's a question. How many of you were raised in a home where one parent was clearly dominant over the other. Raise your hand. All right, just hold them up. I'm not going to try to embarrass you. All right, a lot of hands. All right, those that raise your hands, I have a second question for you. How many of you feel that that domination had a negative effect upon the marriage of your parents and upon your family. Raise your hands. See there? Look around. Same hands, right? Yeah. It's easy to see, right? Doesn't take any, it doesn't take long to answer. I mean, your hands went immediately up because you knew it. It, 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 it. It's not hard to see that. It's not hard to, to put those together. It, it's so easy. And what that means is that you have been reared in a home where one of your parents was not serving the other. They were actually training the other to serve them, which is what dominance is, where you're here to serve me, but I'm not here to serve you. And human beings are the only creations on earth that God did not create to be dominated. Dominance is a sin. The only way to be free from domination is to repent, is to turn away from it. Repent means I stop doing what I'm doing and I start doing something else, 
Repent is a military word that means about face. In other words, instead of walking toward, away from God, I'm walking toward God. To repent means quit doing what you're doing and start doing what you know is right. And that's how, that's how uh, the law of pursuit changes, your, changes your, your actions and your marriage. Jesus was a shepherd, not a sheep herder. You may say, what is the difference between a shepherd and a sheep herder? Well, I saw it the other night. We went to a, a little program up in, up in the mountains, and they had a little nativity deal going on. And in the nativity, they had the shepherds in the fields at night keeping watch over their flocks. And they actually had some real sheep out there. Really, they were mostly goats. But anyway, they, they were representing sheep. And, and, a lot, and, the, and the shepherds were bringing them along to the manger scene, you know, kind of as they were following and they saw the star and, they, and they, were, they were the first on the scene, the shepherds. And, and I noticed that the shepherds were not being shepherds, they were being sheep herders. There is a difference, right? A shepherd is someone who walks out in front of the sheep and leads the sheep. A sheep herder is somebody who gets behind the sheep and herds the sheep, rushes them. Jesus is a shepherd, not a sheep herder. And what I'm saying to you is that Jesus does not dominate us. Jesus leads us. We follow Jesus because we choose to follow Jesus, not because he's back there hurting us and scaring us and manipulating us and conning us. You remember in John 13 what Jesus did? He washed the disciples' feet, right? At the Last Supper, he, he got on his knees and he put a towel on and he washed their feet. And then when he got through washing their feet, he dried them with that towel. Now that's an attitude of a servant. Now Simon Peter, on the other hand, when the guards, when the soldiers came into the garden to, to get Jesus, what did Simon Peter do? Simon Peter pulled out his sword and cut off Malchus, the guard's ear, right? So what, what I'm saying by that is you have a choice in life. And that choice is you can either wear a towel or a sword in life. The towel is the instrument of a servant. The sword is an instrument of a dominator. And you have the choice to be humble or to try to dominate relationships. And one of the big problems that we have in serving each other is that we, want, we have the tendency to, to want to dominate the relationship. Let me give you the third one. All right, we have selfishness, we have dominance. Here's the third one, third problem, a worldly concept of success. This keeps us from, this keeps us from serving each other. We, we just have an idea about success that says to us, if you're successful, then you don't serve other people. Other people serve you. Let me read you what Jesus had to say about this in Matthew 23. This is verse 11 and 12. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Verse 12, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a promise to me. If I exalt myself, I promise you, Jesus said, I'm gonna humble you. <laughs> I'm gonna humiliate you, that's what it boils down to. And if you go ahead and humble yourself, then I promise you that that's gonna exalt you in life. Now, we can prove this to ourselves by what we do every day with where we go and where we spend our money. Where is it that we like to go to spend our money, to buy things, to buy merchandise. We like to go to places that serve us the best, right? How did Walmart become the king of merchandise? And now Amazon is trying to become the king of merchandise using the same method. How, what, what is the method that made Walmart, everybody go to Walmart and buy things? Well, it was so easy to take it back, right? 
I mean, they didn't give you any hassle. They didn't give you any questions. They didn't make you even bring a receipt. I mean, you walked in there and they had a counter set up and there was a wonderful person behind that counter that had been trained to be so nice and so appropriate with people and to be so friendly and warm. And you brought that thing back in there and you said, you know, I, I got this the other day and it just doesn't, it's just not gonna work. It doesn't. Well, is there something, is there something defective about it? No, I, I, just, I just really decided I, I don't want it. Well, all right, thank you very much. Here's your receipt and your money back, you go out to the store. Are you going to go back there? Sure you are. Because they served you so well. You go into a store and you take your receipt and you say, here's my receipt and here's this and that. And they say, they pick it up, they look at it. This has been worn. Uh, 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 they sniff under the arms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this has been worn. I, well, I didn't wear it. My wife ironed it and and I didn't put it on, but, it, well, I'm sorry, sir, we can't, yeah, yeah. now, are you ever gonna go back there? Never. Why? Because they don't serve you. They, 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 they don't care about your business. Where is it that you like to go eat the best? A place where you get the best service? I don't care how good a food somebody has. If they nasty and snarky and won't serve you and neglect you and all, you're not going back there to spend your money. You go and spend your money in places that serve you the best. And the same thing is true in life. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said anybody that exalts themselves, they're going to be humiliated. And everybody who is humble and serves well, and has a good attitude and an attentiveness about them, they're going to be exalted in life. And so we prove that in our own life, and that's true. That, that, that's so true in marriage and so true in, in what happens. The greatest employees, who is it in a place of business that you go to every time you go in there because they are so good and so nice and so friendly and so welcoming, and they just go out of their way to serve you. They run back to the storeroom. They get things and bring it back. They go over there. They help you up with the ladder. They say, no, let me do that, and they get it, and they are just the greatest servants of all. That's who you look for when you go in. Because it's, it's, it's a law of God. <laughs> it, it's service. And one of the reasons why we have problems in marriage is because we don't have that concept. We have the exact opposite concept of that. We have the worldly concept of saying, if they love me, they'll serve me. <laughs> and it's a worldly idea of success. You know, the greatest, you know what the greatest marriage on earth is? The greatest marriage on earth are two servants in love married to each other. And you know when they're the happiest? When they're serving the other one. You know what the worst marriage on earth is? Two selfish people married to each other, trying to dominate each other. And you know when the unhappiest time in life is? When you are waiting to be served. As a matter of fact, when you are serving someone, that is the, you are most likely far more happy than the person that's waiting on your service. You know why? Because God created us to serve. Humanity was created to serve. Now, let me give you the fourth one. The fourth one is this, ignorance of God's nature. I'll make it quick. I got seven more points, but I'm not gonna get to them today. <laughs> not, the servant rules. They're great, I, I think, but anyway, we'll look at them next week. Here's the fourth problem in serving each other, ignorance of God's nature. All right, this event that we're about to read happened in John 21, and it happened right after the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It is actually, if we read more of the passage, you would see this is the third time that Jesus showed himself after he raised from the dead. So it's pretty fresh, all right? Now notice, I want you to see what he's doing. This is John 21, verse nine. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, charcoal fire. And fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. 
Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153, which is amazing that in the presence of the resurrected Lord, somebody would stop to count how many fish there are. But, but they did, 100, I mean specifically, 153, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. All right, remember John 13, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, right? So we all know the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet and being a great servant and having a great humble servant attitude. But did you know that Jesus actually served his disciples breakfast? That Jesus actually served them a breakfast just like we would serve each other? You know why he did that? Because servant is the eternal nature of God. Jesus, I mean, Jesus wasn't playing a game. Jesus wasn't washing the disciples' feet to say, hey, from now on, everybody wash everybody's feet. How about it? Or serving them breakfast to say, well, you know, everybody deserves to be served breakfast. He wasn't playing a game. What Jesus was doing there was showing us the eternal nature of God. And the eternal nature of God is to, is to be a servant. God is a servant God. And I know that, I hope that doesn't fly all over you and you think I'm insulting God. I'm just telling you what the scripture shows us, that God is a servant God. L -l listen to this, listen to this promise in Luke 12. All right, listen to this. Verse 35, this is Jesus speaking now. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Now look at this next line. Gee, assuredly, I say to you that he, who is he? The master that's returning. And who is the master that's returning? It's Jesus. I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. Jesus is promising that if you are watching when he is coming, that he is going to take you to heaven and serve you dinner. And that's the promise here. And he's the master. Did you know that you are being served every moment of every day of your life by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? And it is this service that makes you who you are. God is our Father. And he takes care of us. Every moment of every day, he provides for us. Every moment of every day, he watches over us. Every moment of every day, Jesus the Son is our mediator. He represents us in heaven 24-7. He is our defense attorney against the attacks of the, inner, of the enemy. He says, I, I ever live to make intercession for you. That's what he's doing to serve you. And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers you, teaches you, comforts you, convicts you. The Holy Spirit is working in your life 24-7. God is a servant God, and he chooses to be so. If anyone had the right to, uh, uh, to, to exempt themselves from that rule, it would be God. But God doesn't exempt himself. As a matter of fact, he is the greatest example of being a servant. God created marriage to be a demonstration of his character. That's what Genesis 1 says when the Bible says, and he created them male and female, and he created them 
in his own image, after his own likeness. And then in Ephesians chapter five, when he looked at wives and he says, wives, you be submissive to your husbands. Then he looked at husbands and says, husbands, you, like, you love your wives like Christ loved the church and you both be submitted to each other. It's the greatest of all relationships. It's the character of God. It's the fulfillment of what God put us here for. Oh, there are a few people on earth that, that don't have the needs that everybody else has. That's really a superstructure of people, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. It's a gift, it's a gift from God, but not very many people have it. Very few people have it, actually. Because if, if a lot of people had it, there wouldn't be enough babies born, born on the earth. Most of us don't have that. Most of us are called to someone. And if we will serve, and we will put them in priority, our lives can be blessed. Now, there are two more, and we'll look at them. We'll look at the servant rules next week. Those are interesting, but uh, anyway. All right, let's bow our heads. Mm -hmm.